Last week, Hamilton City Council voted 9 to 6 in favor of moving forward on a $3.4 billion offer from the federal and provincial governments for a light rail transit system. 9 to 6 is hardly what you'd call a resounding victory for the pro-LRT side. Apparently, there are many in the hammer who are still unconvinced the city either needs or can afford to operate this system. To discuss this, let's welcome, in Hamilton, Ontario, Judy Partridge, City Councillor for Ward 15, known as Flamborough East. Maureen Wilson, City Councillor for Ward 1, known as the Shadow Coots area. And Ryan McGreal, editor of Raise the Hammer, an urban and civic affairs blog focused on the Steel City. And we're delighted to welcome all three of you to TVO tonight. We want to just start because I presume that many people watching us right now don't know the route this LRT would take. So let's ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up this graphic and we'll show it. Now remember, everybody, for everybody who lives outside the Steel City, the water is north in Hamilton. It's tucked under Lake Ontario, okay? I know it's west of Toronto, but it's actually under. It's south of Lake Ontario. So imagine the water is at the north part of this picture, and I'll describe it for those listening on podcast. The LRT would start at McMaster University in the west, that's in Westdale, and proceed essentially east along a path all the way to Eastgate in the east practically Stony Creek, with numerous stops, obviously, along the way. It's an east-west route south of Lake Ontario through the heart of the city of Hamilton. Okay, that's the gist of the route that has been approved by City Council. This project has been a long time in the works. Ryan, let's start with you. There have been several iterations of the plan as we've gone along. What do you think of what is presumably the final plan on offer that we just showed? Well, the, the interesting thing about this plan is that it is essentially the same plan that Council approved in 2013 when they de designed this system and they submitted it to the province for approval. Now, the province came back in 2015 with a couple of slight changes. Uh, they shortened the eastern terminus a little bit to Queenston Traffic Circle and added a north spur to the uh, uh, James North GO station. Then in 2017, there was a bit of a crisis around the system. Metrolinx had determined that that North Spur was a high cost for low value, and they ended up deciding to remove that and extend the eastern terminus back to Eastgate Square. So this is the exact project that Council uh, developed and submitted to the province in 2013. And it has had a number of twists and turns along the way, but we're actually back now to a situation where we have full funding and a, a once in a generation opportunity to build this thing. You have full funding to construct it. Do you have full funding to operate it? So the uh, the operational details haven't been finalized yet. It would have to go through a, an RFP process where consortiums would bid on the 30-year contract to construct and operate it. The understanding is that the city would pay the operating and maintenance costs and the province would pick up the financing, life cycle and insurance costs. Okay, I'm, I'm going to pull an audible on our director, Sheldon Osmond, here and ask him for a two-shot of the two city councillors, Sheldon, because I want our viewers to be able to see how... Council has differed in its opinion on this. So let's see if we can get a shot of Maureen and Judy here, a two shot of them, because I want to find out how, there we go, I want to find out. Maureen, how did you vote on this project? Oh, I voted very much in the affirmative. It's a, it's a generational opportunity. It's a fiscally responsible thing to do, and it's about city building uh, at its best. Okay, hold off there. Judy, how did you vote on this? Well, I voted to oppose it. It is a disaster. It is not going to serve the broader community of Hamilton. It is not going to connect all the communities together, which is what a transit system should do. It is certainly not going to get people to where all the new jobs are being created, which is in the airport, Ancaster, Flamborough, Stony Creek business parks. All right, we have two obviously very different views and visions for this project right now. So let's dig into this a little bit if we can. Maureen, you like this plan? You think it works for Hamilton? How come? Well, just in response to that, um, uh, three points. Uh, you always build your rapid transit line where your ridership is the greatest. Um, that's uh, transportation planning, land use planning 101. The east-west corridor is the busiest uh, transit corridor in the city of Hamilton and has been uh, for decades. Um, in so doing, by building this, we're going to enable better transit 
throughout. This is the spine of what in Hamilton we call the BLAST network. So it's, it's integral to growing transit service and better transit service throughout Hamilton. And downtown Hamilton uh, it has the um, greatest number of employees in all of the city. So it, it is a very active employment center in and of itself. All right, let's go to, back to Judy. Judy, you, you said a moment ago it was a disaster. Let's put a little more flesh on that bone. It's a disaster because why? Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to put some meat on the bones. It's a disaster because it is going to be the entire route where the earthworks, when they start this project, it is not going to be done in phases or sections. It's going to be the entire length of the route. So you're looking at 14 kilometers right through the heart of the city being churned up. At the same time, you've got the big arena downtown, which is First Ontario Place. The whole entertainment district is going to start under construction. So, you know, people won't be able to get in and out and move around in the city. For and how many again, years? How? Sorry, go ahead. For, for how many years? Oh, so right now they're probably talking five to eight years. I think we're looking at 10 years. If this goes ahead and gets built, you're not going to have the first riders on that train going through the middle of the city for many, many years to come. Uh, I asked this other follow-up because literally 100 yards north of where I'm sitting right now, uh, there's a $6 billion LRT going across Eglinton, and it has certainly messed up Eglinton for many years in the past and likely will for another couple of years in the future. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a spectacular LRT going across Eglinton all the way from the west of the city to the east. Now, that's here. Uh, I, for, you know... You can debate whether it's worth paying the price of all that disruption for what you're going to get at the end of the day. Why are you not sure that all the disruption Hamilton is going to go through will be worth it at the end of the day? Well, I think you have to look at what are the other cities doing? You know, we're constantly being compared to Kitchener-Waterloo, to Toronto, and to Ottawa. And geez, look at how wonderful those systems are working. Well, those cities invested in building their ridership for many, many years. They had bus rapid transit, BRT. They started with that. Ottawa is a prime example. They connected, similar in geography, they connected all their outlying communities right into the downtown of the city. They built their ridership. Hamilton's ridership has been flat for many, many years. And instead of going the route of the BRT, which by the way, would feed into the BLAST network and connect all the communities within the city of Hamilton, because don't forget, we've got two escarpments that we're dealing with here. So it's not that easy. You're never gonna get the LRT to go up the escarpment on either side. But a bus rapid transit is movable and you can. And by the way, the task force that was established by the province never recommended LRT. They recommended higher order transit, of which BRT is. All right, Ryan, let me do a little fact checking with you here. We've heard estimates just now that this could take five to 10 years of disruption before completed. Do you think that's accurate? No, I don't think that's a realistic estimate at all. Uh, if they were to build the entire system in, you know, in one shot the way Waterloo did and kind of a, a painful tear off the Band-Aid, it'll probably take about three years. If they decide to build it in phases where they, you know, take, say, a half a kilometer at a time, that will take longer, say, up to about five years, but it will mean less disruption to the entire corridor in the interim. Uh, certainly in the past, that was the approach that was being looked at for Hamilton. Ultimately, it'll come down to what the consortium that gets the contract to build it decides to do and the direction they get from Metrolinx. Maureen, what's your understanding of how long this would take? My understanding is, is similar to, to Ryan's. It will be determined by the consortium whether they want to do it all at once or whether they want to do it in phases and where they start and where they they begin. Any infrastructure project um, okay. requires uh, the the town where it's going in to to adjust, uh, but it is uh, an adjustment that is worth making. L let's just be clear here: the federal government and the provincial government said that BRT bus rapid transit is not on the table. It's 3.4 billion dollars in a public investment in a mid-sized city. There has never been a deal like this on the table for a city this size, nor will there be again. It would be, it is fiscally irresponsible. It is environmentally short-sighted to reject this 
generational investment. And I am very grateful to the federal and provincial governments for the confidence they have expressed in this city and in its future and doing what this city asked in the reports that Ryan cited. We we supported this plan. We put forward this plan for funding um, and it is on the table and it remains on the table. And I'm grateful for the investment. Judy, can I get you to speak to that angle? It is not every day that the federal and provincial governments of Justin Trudeau and Doug Ford agree on anything, let alone to give more than $3 billion to a mid-sized city for a new LRT. How do you turn down that kind of money? Well, I don't think you would be turning it down. You know, I mean, you've got to, we, we've got a history of pushing back on governments and being able to negotiate and work things out. And by the way, for a federal minister to come out and say, just a few uh, months ago, the federal government interfering in municipal decisions around transit would just be wrong and we wouldn't do it. Well, guess what? She came out and that's what she said. This LRT. Is, this is Catherine McKenna nothing. you're talking about? I'm talking about Minister McKenna, yeah. yes. Who's, exactly. who's from Hamilton so, originally? It, well, be that as it may, really doesn't mean anything with this project. So I, I'm very concerned that any government uh, of a higher level would dictate to a municipality what they should be doing in terms of transit. You know, transit, and, and to speak to the climate change angle, how are you going to get to the LRT? You have to drive to get there. But oh, wait a minute, there's no parking lots. So you can't park your car to get on it. And what about connecting buses to it? The LRT line in Hamilton runs down the center, as was said before, down the center of the city. It doesn't connect to go. It doesn't connect to anything. And if you look at, again, Ottawa, Toronto, even up in Kitchener-Waterloo, it connects to the go. There's loops involved. That's not happening in Hamilton. And I think it's very poorly planned. And when Metrolinx came in and gave us an update just a couple of weeks ago, they were very clear that they would decide on the construction, when it would be done, how it would be done. And they very clearly said to all of council, we were all listening, that it would be the earthworks that would be done first and it would be done on the entire line. All right, let me so, get Ryan back in here for a sec. Ryan, the the all or nothing nature of this, how is that playing in Hamilton in your view? Yeah, I really need to push back against Councillor Partridge's characterization. The, the idea that the federal government uh, interfered or meddled in a municipal policy is just wrong. Going back to 2007, this LRT plan has been developed and directed and ratified repeatedly by council over literally 60 or 70 votes. The plan that was submitted to the province for funding in 2013 is the plan that the federal government stepped in to help fund in 2021. So it has been council who has dictated what this plan should be. The reason it's an LRT plan and not a BRT plan is that the city didn't submit a BRT plan. And the reason they didn't is that the city staff determined and in a Metrolinx benefits case analysis confirmed that BRT would have a lower capital cost, but a higher operating cost, less ridership growth, less new transit oriented development and fewer overall benefits. So I just, I really have to push back on that. This is a plan that is council is being given an opportunity to take yes for an answer to a plan that council submitted. Well, okay, but Maureen, let me raise this issue with you. Uh, everybody on this call knows that uh, Bob Rutina, the former mayor of Hamilton, now Liberal MP, um, said he's not going to run again for re-election for the Liberals because in his view, major, well, here's the quote, major funding decisions can occur on the whim of a minister who has consulted only like-minded individuals. Uh, he is not happy about the fact that, as he puts it, Minister McKenna has essentially made what, in his view, is a unilateral decision, and therefore, uh, he says he's not running for the Liberals again and is going to bow out of federal politics. What do you make of all that? Oh, I'm sorry. Did he resign as a matter of principle? No, he no, says he's not he, running he again. Mm, no, he's still staying on, and he will collect his pension as such. Um, and Mr. Bettina's position on... Uh, LRT has been inconsistent at best. Let me just say this about the federal. Um, if, if you want to be an elected official and play chicken 
uh, with the federal and provincial government over $3.4 billion in public investment. Uh, that will be on you and that will be on you, you and your constituents to judge whether you believe that is the responsible thing to do. Um, federal and provincial governments uh, put conditions on their transfers uh, to municipal partners all the time. And they involve themselves in transit positions all the time, whether it be electric buses or um, LRT or s subway, um, like in Toronto. Uh, this federal government and this provincial government is doing exactly what this council asked it to do and is exactly what the studies are, are uh, where they landed. And in terms of a fiduciary responsibility, uh, they understand clearly, perhaps more than some of my colleagues, uh, that this plan and LRT gives the greatest return on investment. It gives the greatest uh, potential for transformation. Uh, it supports our efforts to try and grow in a in an urban dense way so we can cut down on greenhouse gases and the cost of sprawl um, it enables us to uh, redo our subsurface infrastructure uh, that instead of falling on the backs of local taxpayers uh, it's going to be spread out across the country i mean it, all the boxes this this checks um, and I, I just think it's highly irresponsible uh, to suggest that we can maneuver our way and negotiate with a federal and provincial government of two political stripes and suggest that we can do something other than LRT. Okay, LRT is just, on the table. Let me, let me just say in the interest of full disclosure here, we did invite um, MP Bratina to come on the program. Uh, he declined to do so. He said he didn't want to get into a spat with uh, city councillors. His big mm -hmm. issue in his view, is the, in his view, interference by Minister McKenna in the process here. Judy Partridge, I'd like you to comment on that only because, you know, Minister McKenna's born and raised in Hamilton. She knows the lay of the land better than, say, if she were approving a, you know, a, a, a plan in um, some other city in some other province. I wonder if you think that gives her added credibility to be involved in the way she has been. Well, no, I don't. Not at all. I, I think it's I think it's an irrele irrelevant point. Um, I would like to comment on MP Bertina, though, and, and let's you know let's be respectful. The man has been very consistent uh, in his position, and to knock him on a TV show when he isn't here to defend himself or speak to himself, I think is is really unfortunate and it's really disrespectful. Um, Minister McKenna, you know, I mean, governments, governments, whether you're federal, provincial, municipality, the history is that you all work together. You don't interfere. You don't take away decisions. You work together and you come up with what is the best plan. And growing up here or living here for eight years when you were a teenager does not make you knowledgeable about the current state of our transit system. Uh, there were a lot of uh, people who were chirping in her ear um, on the yes side, that it was going to be the best thing for our city. But the cost to our taxpayers, and, and let's not leave taxpayers out of this. Come on. We are here to represent our taxpayers, for gosh sakes. And the cost to them, we don't know what the operating costs are going to be. We don't know how much is going to be charged for the fares. We don't know what the maintenance costs are going to be. Heck, we don't even know if the $3.4 billion is going to cover the capital costs. And I really put a big question mark on that. I mean, just look at the cost of everything. It's gone crazy during COVID. How can anybody say that the $3.4 billion is going to cover the cost of the capital? We thought a billion was going to cover the cost of capital. And I want to touch on the 70 or so votes that council has had that people keep throwing in our faces. 95% of those votes were to receive reports. They were nothing more than that. It was not a vote, a yes for LRT. So let's be clear on that. It's just silly to keep going down that road. All right, Ryan, let me get you back in here and talk about the issue Judy just raised on operating costs. Uh, it, is, it, sure. is, it, it, it is today, as we sit here, a fact that the federal and provincial governments have said they're going to pony up $3.4 billion to build the thing. But they haven't said, and we have to presume, I suspect, that they're not going to contribute anything to the operations of the system because the province puts next to nothing into operations of transit systems. Uh, certainly the one here in, in Toronto is um, 
almost all fare box um, uh, funded. So what can you tell us about how this system would be operated in the future and who would pay for it? Sure, absolutely. So right now, there, uh, I mean, when I say right now, I mean pre-pandemic, because obviously the last year has been a bit crazy for transit systems. But pre-pandemic, we had four main bus lines serving this LRT corridor. They have a gross operating cost of $33 million a year. And after fare box recovery, they have a net operating cost of about $18.2 million a year. Now, for comparison, in Waterloo Region, their LRT system, which is about 18 kilometers, it's a little longer than Hamilton's, it has a gross operating and maintenance cost of $8.5 million a year. This is one of the great things about LRT. It costs more to build, but it's actually cheaper, much cheaper per passenger to operate because you have one driver in one vehicle that can carry two or three times as many passengers as an equivalent bus. So the uh, staff uh, and Metrolinx that pres presented information to council, I think it was last week, um, they suggested that if ridership only grows by 8%, and if some of the current service on those bus routes is um, removed, you know, if one route is removed and if the other two are reduced by one third, you would look at a, you would look at a net operating cost of $6.4 million a year. Now that's assuming very conservative ridership growth and it doesn't take into account all of the added uplift and economic development, you know, adding, you know, in, in Waterloo, they've got tens of millions of dollars a year, year in new property tax revenue along their LRT line. That's money that Hamilton would be looking at as well. Okay, Judy, what's the annual budget for the city of Hamilton? So the annual budget for the city of Hamilton right now is 1.6 billion and that's capital and operating. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite huge, but you know, I want to, and I think, well, hang on I, a sec, hang on. Here's the, here, the reason I ask is in a $1.6 billion budget, you don't think you can find six and a half million to operate an LRT? Well, it's not six and a half million. We don't know what the cost is. It's all speculation and it's projections there. We do not know the costs and we've been waiting for a memorandum of agreement to come to the table to have some costs attached to it. We have been waiting for that for about six years now and we keep getting promised it's coming, it's coming. Well, then it got canceled. So, okay, that's fair. Take a couple of years out of that. But they're all speculated costs and you cannot compare Hamilton to Kitchener-Waterloo or any other city. Our demographics are completely different. The downtown demographics there's supposed to be an affordable housing component tied into this. Well, define affordable housing. You know, uh, Minister McKenna has not defined affordable housing. What, oh, well, we'll figure that out later. Well, what's affordable? If you if you think, uh, you know, what normally would be an $1,800 a month apartment is going to be $1,500 a month, we have people, we have residents who are paying five and $600 a month and they're on social assistance. They can't afford anything more than that. That's not what's going to be built. And we don't even know what is the minimum. What is the minimum amount of affordable housing that is supposed to be built along that line according to the agreement with the federal government? We don't know any of that. All right, so let me get back to Maureen. Very different. Let me get back to Maureen Wilson now. Uh, if it, How confident are you that the operation costs of this system will be, as quoted, $6.4 million a year? Yeah, in, in Hamilton, uh, too often we practice what's called Hamilton exceptionalism, meaning uh, we're so unique, we're so different, we can't possibly learn anything from anyone. Um, and what uh, lessons and practices uh, apply somewhere else could not be imported here. And I think what Ryan has uh, referenced are we, we have models in which to look at operating costs and which to get those uh, estimates. Uh, and he has cited them very well. Um, the interesting thing also about the, the comments on operational is we, we never apply these expectations of uh, costs to any other infrastructure project. Uh, we don't. We didn't apply it to the Red Hill Creek Expressway, which you know, I think in 2000 and uh, last year we spent uh, close to uh, $12 million just resurfacing. Uh, unlike other infrastructure, hard infrastructure investments, when you put light rail transit in the ground, development follows in and around it. And it's uh, it increases the value of the land, uh, which 
in return increases the revenue take for the city. So on all of these fronts, um, including what happened in Kitchener-Waterloo, where they enjoyed $2 billion in assessment growth, uh, even in advance of that line being finished, and now they're going into phase two to uh, build some additional LRT, uh, it, it does. Uh, it is transformational. Um, it, it does enrich the city's coffers, and it does it in such a way in an already uh, urban uh, serviced area. So you're not going to be generating forever operational costs. And that's exactly what Sprawl does. It, it's forever a liability. All right, with just a few minutes left to go here, let me really, let me really complicate this story and muck it up entirely, okay? Ryan, I've talked to people in Hamilton who are okay with an LRT, but they think the route is wrong. They think it should have been from mountain to downtown, north-south, as opposed to east-west, that if you were going to build one, that's the route that should have been chosen, and there would be more support for that. What's your position on that? So it's a really good question, actually, and it's got a really good answer. There are essentially three main success criteria for an LRT system. Number one is that you have to have strong existing ridership. You have to have a baseline of people who are going to be using transit. Number two is you have to have a lot of opportunity for ridership growth. And number three, you have to have a lot, a lot of opportunity for new development. Right now, the B line, that east-west corridor that you saw on the map, that has all three. In fact, the city, um, despite turning down 90% provincial funding for a light rail system back in 1981, and that system ended up going to, water, or to uh, Vancouver as their SkyTrain, uh, in 1986, Hamilton Council realized we need to add ridership along this B line or to, to, um, to add service. So they established an express bus line and they've been growing ridership on that route for decades. That's why that was picked as the first route for LRT. I think a B, an A line running north south makes a lot of sense, but the city has some work to do first. We have to build up transit service and we have to build up ridership along that second corridor in order to make it ready for rapid transit as well. Okay, Judy, I got a little time left and two quick questions I need to ask you. Number one, if they'd gone for north-south instead of east-west, would you be more supportive? If we had bus rapid transit, we could do north-south and we could do east-west and we could grow the HSR into areas that are not being served. We have areas throughout the city that are not being served adequately with transit. And until you do that, you're not going to grow your transit. So. You know, it's just, it's such wrong thinking. If we went with bus rapid transit, which by the way is what Kitchener-Waterloo did first and still have a BRT line running into Cambridge, if we had done that, we could have connected the entire city at less cost. That's what makes more sense. Okay, that's the first question. Second question is, um, is there, put it this way, Hamilton's population, which I think is what, between like five and 600,000 right now, maybe closer to 600? <laughs> 580,000, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, it's expected to grow by 40% within the next 30 years. That's pretty massive. Um, can the roads in Hamilton accommodate all of that extra growth if you don't build this LRT? Well, first of all, I agree, we cannot do sprawl. It, it just makes no sense to expand our urban boundaries. When we have available land within our city that we could build up in density, that's what we should be doing. So in terms of accommodating, can the roads accommodate it? Yes, I absolutely believe that they can. And again, we've got areas of our city, both upper and lower, where we can do the, den the density internally. The infrastructure is already there. We might have to increase the size of the infrastructure as sewer and water, but you know what? That is where we need to focus our growth. Maureen, last word to you. I got about 20 seconds. Can the city handle the growth if it doesn't build the LRT? Well, it would mean another generation of um, expropriating land, expanding laneways, uh, and it would mean a, a less livable city. It would mean a city where air quality is um, co compromised, uh, particularly for our young people. Uh, so I think I'm hoping that we have learned the lesson that sprawl costs uh, financially, it costs a lot of money. And if we have in excess of uh, 200,000 people coming into this region over the next number of decades, uh, we have either two ways we can handle that. We can grow out, which is, uh, as 
Councillor Partridge has acknowledged is uh, financially irresponsible and it's not sustainable or we can grow within the urban boundary. And what... The one thing LRT. I can't grow is the clock. I'm plum out of time. <laughs> City Councilors Maureen Wilson and Judy Partridge and Ryan McGreal from Raise the Hammer. Thanks to all of you for coming on to TVO tonight. We're grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very grateful. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.